Well, good morning, uh, or good afternoon, depending on when you're listening. Welcome to Reading Through the Bible in a Year. Uh, this is C.C. Nagy in Naugatuck, Connecticut, and we are going through, this is August 1st, 2024, and the Bible reading for today is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and that's in the New Testament, and in the Old Testament, it's Jeremiah 13 and Jeremiah 14. So if you want to join me, we're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's uh, just open up in a word of prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for another day of life. Thank you especially, Lord God, for your word, for your Son, the Lord Jesus, and for your spirit that dwells within us. We thank you for sustaining us. Thank you for giving us hope. Thank you for giving us purpose and meaning. Father, we thank you for all these things. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so um, I'd like to give you a little bit of background um, on the book of Corinthians. Um, there's a uh, two books, 1 Corinthians and 2, both were written by Paul, and um, 1 Corinthians was written in Paul's um, second missionary journey. And um, the city of Corinth was a city that was rebuilt um, and had become um, quite, um, I, I won't say metropolis, but it was uh, about 400,000 people. And the city had become um, very populous in the fact that um, Paul had visited and had planted a church on his second missionary journey there, and there was trouble. And I'm going to read just a little background on um, the description of Corinth at that time. And it says, the, the population consisted of Greeks, Jews, Italians, and a mixed multitude. Sailors, merchants, adventurers, and refugees from all quarters filled the streets here was held a perpetual vanity fair. The vices of the East and the West met and clasped hands in the work of human degradation. Religion itself was put to ignoble uses. The Greek goddess Aphrodite had here a magnificent temple in which thousands of priestesses ministered to a base worship. Greek philosophy in its decay, showed itself in endless discussions about words, non-essentials, and a tendency to set intellectual above moral distinctions, and a denial of the future life for the sake of unlimited enjoyment in the present. If that doesn't sound like a description of our world today, I don't know what does. And, you know, God has given us his truth, which is timeless, and Paul's letter was to the Corinthian church because of um, much upheaval and trouble that was going on. And he was writing to um, set them straight, to help them out, to give them the ability to refocus uh, their, their hearts and minds on the truth uh, of what they needed to do in order to establish themselves well. Uh, in the same way that we need to do this today. Um, our world has, um, you know, Jesus said, the things of this world, they come in and they choke out my word. Um, if you don't focus in on the word of God, certainly the world will come in and tend to um, choke out the things that are true. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to read the, the chapter. Um, there's 16 verses. Um, and so we'll start with uh, verse 1. It says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 
Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man, which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but with the Holy Ghost, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, but they are because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Um, there's, um, if you didn't hear it in, the, in those 16 verses, the word wisdom was used uh, eight times. Um, it's significant, uh, a significant amount of time. And there's a reason that Paul uses the word wisdom. Um, there's the wisdom of the gospel, and then there's the wisdom of the that the Spirit of God gives, and there's the wisdom of God's plan of salvation and so so there's all these things that paul is referring to not the wisdom of the world and again when i read the introduction um the the, um, the culture was very much into um, defining uh who they were with words and not necessarily by morality so this here, Paul, is, is harping on the fact that there's this sharp contrast between um, the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. And so this church um, is young, it's growing, and he's refocusing them, getting them to understand, listen, you know, yes, there's a lot coming in on you. Um, there's a lot of evil. There's a lot of wickedness. There's a lot of things that are just not of God that are going on. And I want you to focus on these things, these mysteries, these invisible things that we don't see, the wisdom that has been given to us. And we're going to walk through that just a little bit. So um, Paul says in verse um, in verse 1, uh, he says, and, and, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So, he begins by telling the people in Corinth, I'm, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to bring you back to the testimony of God. And what is this testimony of God that he's referring to? And um, I found a really neat um, writing, um, a write up on, on this verse in particular. And it has to do with this testimony of God that, that Paul was referring to. And what is it that he was causing these people to, to contemplate. And uh, John Gill says this. He says, concerning the testimony of God, that is, the gospel, which bears a testimony to the love, the grace, and the mercy of God, to his kindness and goodwill to the sons of men, in giving and sending his only begotten Son to be Savior and Redeemer, Redeemer of them, and in which God bears a testimony of his Son, of this sonship, deity, mediation, incarnation, obedience, sufferings, and death, of his resurrection, ascension into heaven, seated at the right hand, 
intercession for his people, and his second coming judgment, and of eternal life and salvation by him. So there's a lot there, but it encompasses many facets of what Paul was referring to about the testimony or the written truths that God was conveying. And this is what Paul is saying here. He's saying um, that declaring unto you the testimony of God, he says. And, and that testimony has to do with all of those things that I just referred to. Um, all of the aspects of God's written word to us. And Paul says, for I determined, in verse 2, he says, For I determined to know nothing among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, um, when we talk to people today, um, Paul's already said, I didn't come with, in verse 1, he says, I did not come with excellency of speech. Uh, or with or with or with wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God he just spoke forth the truth of God this is what God says and I'm gonna want you to continue to focus in on these things and we as a, as, as a as a people who love God also need to do that same thing we need to be able to share the truths of God's written word here when he says that I I, I, I preach nothing to you but Jesus Christ and him crucified that is the crux of Christianity. It is the 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 death and and um, crucifixion of Jesus Christ, his raising from the dead. Right. So the sins were put upon Jesus Christ. He rises from the dead. So Paul says, "This is what my focus is. This is what I came to make sure that you um, saw that I was teaching. I didn't come to you with with smooth talk like the like the philosophers, like the Greeks." I came to you with one purpose, and that was to preach Christ and him crucified. And that was what? For the salvation of men. So he, he's getting the Corinthian church to stay focused on the one thing that's important. So all of the things that are coming in from the world, don't pay attention to them. Pay attention to this one thing that I shared with you, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul continues on. He says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And you say... Well, why would Paul be in such, you know, in, in a place where there's weakness, where he says, I've come to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling? Paul went through a lot. And I'm going to read to you just um, a little bit of what happened to Paul. And, and this comes from 2 Corinthians um, chapter 11. It says, Are they ministers of Christ? Uh, I speak as a fool. I am more, in laborers more abundant, in stripes above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I, forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I, thrice I survived shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys, often, perils in water, perils of robbers, perils by mine own countrymen, Perils by the heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils amongst false brethren, in weariness and in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness, beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. That's Paul. <laughs> I just... It's hard to fathom that a man could go through so much, and yet he did. So when he writes in verse 3 that, uh, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, um, that had to be a part of his life. That had to be something that he had to deal with on a regular basis. But he pursued coming to the Corinth church. He, he pursued planting that church, and now he's following up with this letter, first and second letters. So that's a little bit about Paul's um, suffering and hardship that he went through and why he said what he said. But I'm going to read on here in verse 4 where Paul says this. He says, In my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So he's saying, listen, when I speak... The focus is never going to be on me. It's going to be on what God says in God's wisdom. And, and I'm not going to go ahead and I'm not going to say, well, you know, this is, 
this is um, who I am. I'm Paul. I, I, I'm, I'm a, you know, a Pharisee of Pharisee. I'll read to you who Paul was. Um, in Philippians chapter 3, this is who Paul says he was. He says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath, whereof he might trust us in the flesh, I have more. So Paul's saying, if you think you've got something in your life to be proud of, that you could say, well, you know, this is who I am. Paul says, I have even more. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and is touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. But that, but what things were gained to me, those I counted a loss for Christ. So Paul doesn't boast in himself, doesn't boast in his knowledge, doesn't boast in his knowledge of the scriptures. He just says, I didn't come to you with any of that, not with eloquence of speech, because what? I want your faith not to be in me. I want your faith to be in God and in the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's it. And Paul does this um, in a magnificent way by focusing them on the truth of the word of God. Let's go to verse 6. It says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. So um, there's, a, there's a verse in Ephesians 2.2 2 that I want to share with you. Um, and it has to do um, with the last part of verse 6, which says, nor the princes of this world, nor the princes of this world. He's not talking about, you know, governors or presidents or, um, you know, emperors. Um, but it says in Ephesians 2, 2, where in times past ye walked according to the counsel of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So Paul's reference here um, in, in verse 6 is, how be it that we speak wisdom among the, amongst them that are perfect. So these people that, that Paul is, he's giving credit to the Corinthian church. He's saying, you're perfect. Now, are they perfect? No, not in the sense that we think of the word perfect, but in the sense that he's saying, um, you are complete. You're lacking nothing. Um, when you've been born again of the Spirit of God, you've been adopted. You're his. So you lack nothing. And so I speak to you in this way, not in the wisdom of the world, nor in the princes of this world that have come to naught. Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, there's a lot in this verse. Um, there's, there's again, the word wisdom is mentioned again. But besides that, um, it says, The wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So, what is what is the, the thing that's going on here? Um, this, this essence of... Um, the wisdom and of the wisdom of God in a mystery. What is this mystery that Paul's speaking of to the Corinthian church? Some of the mysteries that Paul is re is referring to here is 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 that there's the the Trinity. So so the Trinity is a mystery. We don't understand um, three persons uh, yet in, yet in one divine essence. Um, there's the mystery of God being manifested in flesh, Jesus Christ being born and being made into a man. Um, there's the mystery of the, of the spirit of, of um, God's grace in our lives to regenerate us. Um, we don't, th it's not tangible. It's not something you can see. It's a mystery. There's the mystery of the saints, uh, union with Christ. Uh, Christ says that um, to his disciples, you and I are one. And, and, and this goes for us as well. We're one with Christ. So there's this mystery. There's things that we don't understand. And Paul is speaking of this wisdom, and he says in verse 7, we speak of the wisdom of God in mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world. So what is this wisdom, um, this hidden wisdom of God before? Now, remember, Paul was, was a Pharisee. Uh, he knew the Old Testament very well, um, but... The things that were written in the Old Testament, um, either through people like Joseph, 
uh, who was uh, a type of Christology. So in other words, he represented uh, aspects of Christ uh, or Moses or Abraham. But also there's a foreshadowing, a foreshadowing in the temple, in the way that the temple was built and all the elements. If you go into the book of Exodus, you will find uh, our church just went through the book of Exodus, so you know we did everything from you know the curtain and 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 the the the, the basins and the lampstands and um, the the um, the Ark of the Covenant and so so all of these were um, a picture of the 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 Messiah who would come and how he would redeem the world of their sin. And Paul says, before the foundation of the world. Well, that's pretty interesting. As, as I did some digging, um, it says in Titus, it says, uh, Titus 1-2, it says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Hmm. Promised before the world began. So, you know, it's not like, you know, Adam sinning and our sin, it's, it's never caught God off guard. Um, you know, your sin or my sin, um, in God's eyes, he has accounted for that. He has understood that and he sees that. And he graciously uh, is willing to forgive. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18, 19, and 20, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as the Lamb of as as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days for you. So there's this beautiful picture that God, even before the foundation of the world, there's this lamb that's been prepared. Um, and, and this is what God has um, spoken to um, Paul as, as he is sharing these truths with the Corinthian church, where he mentions, he says that they were ordained before the world unto our glory. And, you know, the neat thing is, is that um, we're going we're gonna to go on to um, the next verse, which is verse 8. Um, it says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, they would not have known you know, th this wisdom that God gives, if the prince of this world had known about it, they would have, they would not have let, it's what he says in verse eight here. He says they would, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So what is he saying? What is Paul saying here? He's saying, he's saying, you know, the mystery of what God foreordained before the beginning of the world was hidden. The Old Testament spoke of it. They spoke of a Messiah. They spoke of a Redeemer. They spoke of the redemption of sin. They spoke of a time when the, that Messiah would walk upon the earth and he would be filled with wisdom and the spirit of understanding and counsel. But nobody understood the fullness of him being put to death and rising from the dead. And 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 the, these are some of the some of the indicators in First Peter one nine through twelve. It says. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and search diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time that the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, did, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported to you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things angels desire to look into. So angels were not even privy to what was going on, and neither was the devil. And 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 we know that's we know we know the devil had no clue what was going on, because he's the one who entered he he's the one who entered Judas to betray him. He, he's, he, it's, the, the scripture says that Satan entered in to Judas before he went out and betrayed Jesus. So um, that's not often that you... I don't know that it's, it, it, it describes Satan working in that way um, in any other person. Um, but irrelevant. The point is, is that Satan did enter into 
um, Judas, and he caused him to betray Jesus to be crucified. Now, if Satan knew that sending Jesus to the cross to die for the sins of the world, he wouldn't have had Judas be enter. He wouldn't have entered into Judas. He wouldn't have had him betray him. He didn't know. He didn't understand. And that's exactly what the scripture says here in verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So the mystery and the wisdom and the foreknowledge of God, he told his prophets, he spoke to people throughout the Old Testament and told them through these prophets that Messiah was coming, but it was clouded. It was not clear as far as exactly who Messiah would be. Now, as Jesus began to fulfill prophecy, um, it was, it should have been understood because Jesus said to Nicodemus, when Nicodemus said, you know, um, what must I do? Like, what do you, what do you, what is this teaching? And, and Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, well, do I climb into my mother's womb again? And Jesus said, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know what's going on. You don't know what I'm saying. So clearly, God is saying that there was enough in the Old Testament for Nicodemus to know what was going. He should have been able to put two and two together, but he didn't. And and that's something that um, Paul here is referring to when he's saying that if the, the prince of this world knew, they wouldn't have crucified him. Because the whole idea was this was God's um, secret, his secret wisdom, his mystery about what he was going to do. And that mystery was revealed in Christ when he died upon the cross and the sins were put upon him. And those sins, when, when, when Jesus cried out, um, Abba, Father, you know, he says, uh, Father, um, um, into, into your hands I commit my spirit. You know, and then he says, it is finished uh, upon the cross. So, so Jesus takes the sins of the world upon him um, at that time when he dies on the cross. And that is, you know, the spectacle that and, and I don't know whether there's another verse in Scripture in the New Testament where it says that he made a spectacle of his enemies. And he wasn't talking about the Romans or the Jews, or he was talking about the spiritual enemy. Uh, in First John, it says the reason that the Son of God came was to destroy the work of the devil. He came to destroy the work of the devil. And what is the work of the devil? The work of the devil was way back in the garden, he deceived Adam and Eve, Right? Actually, he deceived Eve, is what Scripture says. But Adam and Eve both ate of the fruit. They both sin entered the world through Adam. It was Adam who, who God held responsible, even though it was Eve who was deceived, Scripture says. So all the way back into the garden, this, this whole episode started where when they sinned, they were removed from God. They were separated from God. And God said, if you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. God cannot go back on his word. They had to die. And Satan was the one to whom God said that he had created hell for. God did not create hell for human beings. So God's marvelous, mysterious, wonderful, wisdom-filled plan was to redeem the world through his son, the, the, the blameless, spotless lamb of God foreordained before the beginning of the world. But the world through the prince of this world did not know that. Um, so let, let's read on. It says, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now many people take this verse and they say, say, well, we're just, you know, like this is like, God, like when we get to heaven, there's things that, well, that's not what it's talking about here. It, 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 uh, if you read, let's read verse 10 and it'll clear this up for us. Verse 10 says, but God hath revealed them to us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. So so in verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, God is saying, listen, um, there, there, there has been, there has, in, in this, it says, at his, in verse 9, it says, but as it is written, that's from Isaiah 64, 4. And Isaiah 64, 4 says this. This is what Isaiah 64, 4 says. Uh, and verse 5. It says, For since the beginning of the world men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, 
O God, besides thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. So this is what Paul's referring to. It is written, he says, but as it is written, he's talking about the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah said, there's this prophecy. There's this, like, something's going to happen. Thou meet, verse 5, Isaiah 64, verse 5 says, Thou meetest him that rejoicest and worketh righteousness. Remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. In those is continuance, and we shall be saved. So Isaiah is saying that, no, but no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. And what has he prepared for those who love him? He has provided salvation. He has provided a gospel message for the world. But nobody had heard it. Nobody had understood it. And that's what Isaiah was saying. But Paul refers back to it now. And he says, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard. But verse 10, he says, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. So when we have the spirit of God living in us, we are regenerated. We are now adopted children. We are uh, sons and daughters of God. We are privy to the information that God has made available to us. Let's read on. Verse 12. Now we have received not a spirit of the world, but a spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. I'm going to stop there real quick. And I just want to read um, the things that are freely given to us. If I can find, um, here it is here. So what is he freely given to us? He has freely given us eternal life. He has freely given us adoption as sons. He has freely given us the remission of sins. He has freely given us justifying righteousness. He has freely given us his Holy Spirit. He has freely given us his son. So, so in verse 12, um, when it says that we might know the things that are freely given to us. Those things are available to, for every believer, and they should know these things. It's the world that doesn't know what has been given to them upon repentance. Um, and, and this is something that's paramount. It's understood, and Paul gets to this in the next couple of verses. He says in verses 13, um, but uh, he says, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but with the Holy Spirit, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, so somebody who doesn't know God is the natural man, right? So he's still in his flesh. He's not born of the Spirit of God. He's not a spiritual creature. He's dead to his spirit. And that's what happened when Adam died. His spirit died. His, his communication with God died. Um, such such that it was a right relationship. God still reached out to him, but he didn't walk with God. But the natural man, this is verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, but they are spiritually discerned. People in the world don't understand their need of salvation. They don't understand what sin has done to them. They don't understand that they are living in rebellion to God. They don't understand the universe that God created, the world, at, at the way that he created human beings. Um, they, 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 they think that, you know, that we've evolved from, from apes. They, they, they think that um, the, these scientific truths are true because of their natural mind instead of having the mind of God. So um, verse 15 says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged by no man, right? So we have a Father in heaven who judges us, right? That's God's job to judge us. He, he uses his Holy Spirit to bring about correction in our lives. The Holy Spirit brings conviction, not condemnation, conviction. The enemy brings condemnation, but the Spirit of God brings conviction. In verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? but we have the mind of Christ. So Paul ends with that mystery again, but we have the mind of Christ. How do we have the mind of Christ? Because you're being transformed by the renewing of your minds. It's the word of God that we receive faith. It's, it's by faith that we understand these mysteries that God has given to us that have been hidden since before the world began. So Paul is just, you know, this chapter's chock full of, of wisdom and mystery and understanding that he is basically bringing to this Corinthian church and saying, listen, these are all truths 
and and you have them and I'm not coming to you with eloquence I'm just going to speak to you truth and these truths are what God has foreordained he's given us his spirit and these and this holy spirit of God reveals truth to reveal the mysteries from all the prophets and all the things that have gone in the past all the shadows of things to come we now can live them he explains those things which are freely given to us and Paul just encourages this church because they are in the midst of a world of chaos and they're in the midst of a world that is very morally corrupt decaying greatly and here they have a church that needs to stand and grow and reach those that are lost and so he's giving them an example preach Christ and Christ crucified and what he has done and how he has freed you and what are these great mysteries so it's a beautiful chapter and uh, one well worth meditating on um, I enjoyed greatly um, diving in and, and, and having the, um, the Spirit of God show me things that um, hopefully were a blessing to you and uh, I pray that the, the rest of your day goes well um, and I'm just gonna close in prayer Heavenly Father Thank you for this time. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mysteries revealed. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, which dwells within us and giving us the ability to discern and have counsel and comfort and, and have the spirit of truth and teach us, lead us, and guide us. Um, in a world of darkness, Lord God, you are truth, and we thank you for that. We thank you that you are uh, a God who loves and cares and has great compassion upon your people. Thank you that you have well equipped us, Lord God, um, to stand firm against the prince of this world. We thank you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Hope you have a great day. Blessings to you.